Beware, children, beware a certain kind of woman. It is not enough to stay away from the woman. Tend your heart that she does not encroach upon the edges of it. Do not let her shadow cross your lovely face. Do not let your own shadow cross over hers. All manner of tricks wait for you at the behest of the woman. Evil deeds that are games to her, flippant gestures and careful maneuvers are all at her disposal in an effort to toy with you. All because someone hurt her so bad that she thinks that these actions are acceptable, or because the world is an experiment in which the only goal is to see how much of what she wants she can get. There once was a troupe of traveling performers who made their way in the world by going from town to town and making merry for the folks who lived there. They had a fool, dancers, a musician, an acrobat, and an especially talented storyteller. He could create entire worlds from nothing. While he spoke, these worlds became more real than the places the listener inhabited. At his whim, skies were bluer and lush valleys greener. At his whim, everything went gray. He would take the willing to palaces in the clouds and sea fortresses guarded by mermaids. He would fill the skies with dragons and the earth with knights to fight them off. He was beloved not only by the townsfolk in the places they went, but also by his troop. For his stories made the hours go by more quickly as he created around them beasts and fairies while they set up their stage area from the caravans or gathered wood for fires or water for drinking when the beer or wine ran dry. One day, he and the fool were gathering wood as he wove a story of starving sailors at sea who caught a mermaid when they wanted fish. The sailors debated over whether or not to kill her, a discussion complicated by the fact that she looked like the dead wife of a widower who was trying to drown his sorrows at sea. A strange maiden appeared from amidst the trees and asked him if this story was true. He told her that in his experience it wasn't, at least not directly, but that in his heart it was. She nodded and they looked into each other's eyes. The storyteller was drawn in. Hers were so soulful, deep, and sad. He was smitten. The fool tugged at the storyteller's sleeve, realizing that it was likely already too late. We must get back, the fool said. Do we have enough wood? The storyteller said. He could have answered his own question with a glance, but his eyes never left the strange maiden. More than I can juggle, the fool said. Wait, the strange maiden said. How can I hear more of your stories? You can't, the fool said. You can, the storyteller said. Tonight we will build a fire and perform for the town. You will come, won't you? Perhaps, she said, and took her leave, freeing him up to do the same. That night, he looked for her among the crowd, only to find the same faces he saw everywhere else. And for the first time in the history of the troupe, his stories were, although passable and even better than average, nothing spectacular. The musician did what he could to liven them up, but it was not the same. No one was forlorn yet, for although their reputation was crucial to the troupe's success, they still had two more nights in town. The next day, before the storyteller and the acrobat went out to gather wood, the fool warned the acrobat of the strange maiden, but it was to no avail. Although the acrobat led them in every direction away from the strange maiden's swamp, all of the wood was wet, even though it had not rained. They walked for a long time in silence, which was uncharacteristic of time spent with the storyteller. Only as they reached the strange maiden's realm, did they find usable wood, and did the storyteller begin to speak? 
He told of a princess's quest to save the kingdom after her father is split in half by his youngest daughter's beauty, and he becomes impotent, and the land falls fallow. She asked the storyteller again if the story was true. He told her again, if not in our experience, in our hearts. And she smiled a smile to match her eyes. The acrobat interceded to tell his friend that it was time to go. Without looking, the storyteller asked the acrobat if they had enough wood. Enough that I cannot hold it in my feet if I stand on my hands, the acrobat said. The storyteller asked her if she would come that night. Perhaps, she said, taking her leave and freeing him to do the same. She was not at the fire that night, and once again, the storyteller's tales were, though better than average, not their best. By this time, the acrobat and the fool were quite concerned, and before bed that night, they warned the rest of the troop and suggested canceling their last night. But the musician and dancers were not concerned. Even the best performer could have an off night, something that the storyteller was long due for. Besides, they would leave the morning after the next night's show, and the storyteller would have a brief and common dalliance with a pretty but common maiden, and would forget all about the encounter in the woods. For all the fool and acrobat's insistence, they were outnumbered, and the troop decided to stay. The next day, it was the musician who went to gather wood with the storyteller. The musician played his guitar, and although he had not succumbed to the acrobat and the fool's concerns, he insisted on going in directions opposite of where they would find the strange maiden. But as they looked, they only found rotted wood that was not suitable for a fire. It was only when they headed in the direction of the strange maiden's realm that the wood became tenable and the storyteller began to sing along with his friends playing as they wove a tale of a lonely and mysterious girl in a haunting tomb. Twas a fair maiden, soft, strange, and alone. These were her ways and she wandered the woods. When I saw a fair maid, she showed me my heart, ripped it right from my chest, although it felt good. in this way that the musician knew that it was all over for his friend. It had been before the previous night's council. They would find the strange maiden, and the storyteller would do whatever she said. As if summoned by thought, the strange maiden appeared, asking if the storyteller's words were true. Look into your heart, the storyteller said. And as her chest rose and fell, it was as though he was looking into her heart so open to the truth of his words. Like the acrobat and the fool, the musician did not like her, and like the acrobat and the fool, he wanted to get his friend away from the maiden as quickly as possible, but they did not yet have any wood. I have gathered wood for you, the maiden said. You may take it if you need to rush away like the other times. The storyteller said that they did not need to get back just yet. But soon, the musician added, I could listen to your stories forever, the maiden said. I could cook and clean and tend garden, gather wood and water with you, while you told your beautiful stories to me, dawn until dusk, when we would tuck away together. And when I cannot sleep, you can fill my ears with midnight whispers, and the wind and rain outside will not be able to touch us. The musician had been on the road for quite some time and understood the importance of an occasional indoor room and the company that would be enjoyed there, something that the troupe had not managed to arrange in a while. The storyteller stepped closer to her. Rather than attempt to pull the storyteller back, the musician stepped closer as well. You should come hear him around the fire with everyone else, the musician said. The stories he tells us by ourselves are bits of magic like fireflies. 
When a crowd is gathered, the fireflies are a tapestry that creates a new world. And what about you, musician? I would like to hear you play, she said. It was the worst sort of flattery, but the only chance he had of reaching his friend was to meet him halfway to where he was. So the musician took out his guitar and played a quick tune. The musician told her that she would hear more if she came that night before taking one of the bundles of wood she had prepared for them and gestured to the storyteller to do the same. The storyteller abided and the strange maiden took her leave, freeing him to do the same. You're going to stay with her, aren't you? The musician said. I feel like I don't have a choice, said the storyteller. You do, the musician said. Do you think she would come with us, said the storyteller? No, the musician said. And then, you will no longer get to see the world. I have seen the sea, the woods, and the mountains. I have seen swamps and valleys and plains. My eyes are full of the things I have seen, and I am satisfied, the storyteller said. You will miss out on other maidens fair, the musician said. There are no other maidens fair, the storyteller said. You will miss the reactions of thousands to the tapestries you weave with words, the musician said. Every story that I tell will be about her, until my tapestry creates an audience that is a thousand different versions of her, the storyteller said. The musician told his friend that he missed him already, and the storyteller returned the sentiment, but he did so half-heartedly. Too busy was he telling himself the story of what living with a strange maiden would be like to comprehend the gravity of the hole that would appear where their friendship had once been. That night, she did show up to see them perform, and though the storyteller noticed her, he was blind to the fact that the townsfolk would not sit or stand next to her, and some of them left entirely when they saw her there. The show proceeded as usual, with music all around and people making offerings as the fool, acrobat, and dancers created whimsy. Then, everything settled down and the storyteller began to speak. He told the story of two brothers banished from their home by their own mother, who was jealous of the attention their father gave them, and of that which they gave their father. And as their mother banished them, she cursed them into being one and turned their love into a giant. They had to go far and do much in order to undo the spell. Almost immediately, it was as though everyone there were living the story themselves. By the end, everyone listening remained in a shared lingering dream. The strange maiden, although she was not immune to the trance, moved when no one else could. She placed at the feet of the fool a golden ball that allowed him to juggle as many things at once as he desired, and none of them would drop as long as the ball was one of them. She placed at the feet of the acrobat a headband that would allow the wearer to balance on as little as a pinky finger or toe while the rest of his body flew and he could never fall. She placed at the feet of the musician an enchanted guitar which would play any existing song as well as any song the musician could think of without him having to work it out. She hummed as she took the storyteller's hand and guided him, weaving through the spell and all those under it. She took him back to her little cottage outside of town where he told her a story of a flighty princess held captive in a castle by a dragon who said he wanted sons but lashed out every time that it looked as though she may have one. She began to disappear into the castle walls until she was rescued by a knight who took her to live with him, only to have the knight die and the princess vanish anyway. Time passed in a haze, days, weeks, and months spent in story worlds. It was not long before she was with child. Before it seemed possible, the traveling troop faded. They became a speck of memory. 
one seldom visited for whenever the storyteller would begin to speak of traveling musicians, fools, or acrobats, the strange maiden would leave him without an audience. If he continued to tell the story to himself, she would demand his presence and assistance with a different household matter, with the expectation that he continued to tell a story of a different type. Sometimes she clutched her right midsection, claiming to be in pain. And while she continued to enjoy his stories, for the most part, they doled without an audience, and without his travels, they sunk into domesticity. Also, although he spent as much of the day as he could with a pen in his hand, collecting thoughts on paper, humming pale approximations of the inspiring music formerly provided by his estranged friend. She discouraged this behavior while maintaining the expectation that he continue to tell her stories. She did not listen when he explained that it was not possible for him to come up with his tales without doing the very activities she forbade. After their son was born, she only became more demanding. She demanded more stories for both of them while offering virtually no time to develop them. Their second son was born less than two years after the first. The storyteller delighted in his sons and was once again able to tell vivid stories that the young boys responded to with sounds of glee. Yet every time that his wife came across this, she became jealous and possessive. Of the stories, of the children, of the storyteller, it was as if them having a relationship separate from her was an affront. The storyteller found himself weeping at times in the midst of other mundane activities. He was preoccupied with the prospect of death, his own or that of his wife, and he found himself occasionally unable to breathe. As her cruelty expanded to include not just himself, but their sons, he resolved to leave. His knowledge of the area was limited and his memories of the road in were distant. All that they owned belonged to his wife, but all that he needed was his quill, his dwindling paper, and his sons, as well as the clothes on their backs. He could make his way with that. He set out before dawn. In each hand, he held the hand of one of his sons. He kept them silent with a story about a woman so overwhelmed with household duties that she went to a wizard who split her in two just so that she could get everything done, but she could not stand her doppelganger, even as her family grew attached to the interloper. As he talked, a crow came and plucked his quill from his pocket. There was nothing he could do for the bird flew high and hid from him. And when a hedgehog came and took his satchel with his paper, there was nothing he could do, for the little animal burrowed underground with it. It did not matter so long as he had his sons. They continued forward through the trees and the dark and the slippery mud. When they came to a clearing, bathed in moonlight, he nearly fell to his knees with the joy of having made it to the edges of the safety of the city. But as he crossed into the silver light, his hands were emptied by magic forces. He turned around to see the strange woman, his wife, holding his sons, one in each arm. He stepped toward them, but he could not cross the threshold to where his family was. She said nothing, just smiled and left him to run into the invisible wall over and over as she walked away. He waited there for many days and nights until he grew weak with hunger and prolonged wakefulness. The only story he told himself was that of the strange woman walking away with his sons. As he lay on the mossy forest floor, his shoulder pressed against the invisible barrier. Birds came along and dropped berries and other small fruits into his mouth. He would spit them out, but to no avail, the birds just brought more. Everything in the forest was working for her, as always.
He could not go back home and indeed did not want to, except to retrieve his sons. But anymore, it was unclear if he could leave by any means other than death. Further, every time he moved to try, he was pulled back by his urge to see his sons again. It happened after he had been there a month. He looked to the trees and saw his strange wife, a babe at the hand and one on the hip. By her guidance, they did not see him. He had an impulse to call out to them, but every impulse had betrayed him around the strange maiden. He stayed silent. It happened every month at the full moon that his family would appear this way, and he would watch them invisibly. The storyteller became more willing to eat what the birds brought him. He began to construct stories for his sons on the hope that one day they would come close enough that he could tell them. Tales of musicians, fools, acrobats, and dancers. Sometimes he imagined the troop appearing and offering to take him away. But even if they had, he would not have gone, for that would have meant not seeing his children. He waited. Every month he saw the strange woman. Every month she saw him. Even as the boys let go of her hands, they did not see him. Although he was always preparing to tell the boys a story, he never spoke, for fear that if he made a sound, he would be left all alone. This went on for 12 seasons. It was a bright day when his older son approached on his own. Be careful, the storyteller said. Don't come too close. I am trapped here, and I don't want the same for you. How did you get trapped there, the boy said. It is not important, the storyteller said. Would you like to hear a story? He told the boy the story of a shapeshifter who had many adventures only to get trapped in the body of a fair maid he had wronged. As the sun dipped low, the boy stood. He told the storyteller that he liked listening to him, but he had to get home. His mother sometimes got angry. What do you mean, the storyteller said. It's not important, the boy said. The storyteller suggested that if his mother got angry about all kinds of things, it was best not to tell her about their meeting. The boy nodded in agreement and with no hesitation, as if he had already intended to keep the encounter as part of his secret self. Also, the storyteller said, it is best that you not look my way. Should you go visiting with her to that tree? And he pointed at the tree where he had seen them. The boy nodded in agreement again, and he walked away home. Although the storyteller was alone again, in his mind, he went over his son's visit many times. It was a short few days until he had the encounter memorized, and the memory was a gem, and at its very center was a happiness that he would keep with him in his heart always that had not been there before. He worried about the strange maiden's anger. It was another two seasons before the boy arrived again. The storyteller warned him again do not get too close. The boy nodded and sat cross-legged across from the storyteller and listened to his tale of a musician who had been tricked by a fox in disguise into becoming a merchant. And part of the fox's spell was that the musician had to trick others like him into becoming merchants as well. Until one day the musician turned merchant could also be a fox and scamper away. The sun dipped low and the boy stood. He told the storyteller that he liked listening to him, but he had to get home. Sometimes his mother got angry. The storyteller asked him to say more, but the boy would not elaborate. Perhaps, the storyteller said, if she gets angry about all kinds of things, it's still best not to tell her about meeting me here. The boy nodded in agreement. If he told his mother, she would do what she could to take this away. He told the storyteller that he would not look his way, and he walked home. Again, the storyteller told himself over and over of the encounter until it crystallized into a gym to keep at the center of him to make him better for the rest of his days. 
Again, he worried about the strange woman's anger. It was another two seasons before the boy arrived again. The storyteller warned him again, do not get too close. The boy nodded and sat cross-legged across from the storyteller and listened to his tale of two friends who encountered a demon offering them all the wealth a person could spend and fame as well as adoration in exchange for their souls. Although only one friend accepted the deal, they both benefited from it, and at the end of their lives, the friend who had rejected the deal was left to reconcile with fate. As the sun dipped low, the boy stood. He told the storyteller that he liked listening to him, but he had to get home. Sometimes my mother gets angry. Even as the storyteller pressed, the boy had no more to say. Perhaps, the storyteller said, if she gets angry about all kinds of things, it's still best not to tell her about meeting me here. The boy nodded in agreement with no hesitation and agreed. If he told his mother, she would do what she could to take this away from them both. He told the storyteller that he would not look his way, and he walked away home. As with the other times, the storyteller retold himself the encounter, a precious gem that he kept within, although he worried about the strange woman's anger. When the boy arrived again two seasons later, he had his brother with him. The boy told the storyteller that he had already warned his brother that these encounters were secret, and that they were not to look at the storyteller when they were at the tree with their mother. The storyteller began, and again spoke until dark, about a fair maiden who was turned into a giant by misfortune rather than fault. She spent many happy years in the kingdom of the giants, only to have the curse broken, and she turned into a woman once more, and the giants ate her. When the boys left, they assured him that they would not say a word, and they would not look in his direction, although neither would they share with him stories of their mother's anger. They held true to their word, not looking at him, nor speaking a word of their encounters. And soon it became that when they would come to visit the storyteller, they would entertain him with their own stories. And like him, they created worlds vivid and immersive. And during their visits, the storyteller's cup ran over, and it took almost until they came back again to empty. And still, as much as he could, he committed every second to memory. And although he did not get to see them every day as he wished, he got to see the small boys grow into capable youths with storytelling abilities that exceeded even his own. He was proud, and though his life was limited to his sliver on the edge, it was not unfulfilling. He was waiting for them one day at the usual time. He was practicing how he would ask them if they wanted to breach the invisible wall and go away with him to better places in the world now that they were a bit older. But they did not come. And as it became night, he pushed again against the invisible wall until he exhausted himself. Days passed and he did not see them or the strange woman at the tree. Birds and wild creatures fed him once more. He almost perished in the starving winter. He would not chew of his own volition, so the birds had to be very clever to drop food in just as he was waking. This way he would swallow it and not choke. This way he would swallow it and not spit it out. He looked beyond, unsure all these years of where he could pass to and whether he could come back. But as long as his sons might come to him, he couldn't find the strength to test the invisible boundaries. Despite himself, he found that he was holding on to hope that they would show up again. And the next day he expected them, he waited, practicing what to say, should they be willing to run away with him. But again, they did not appear. Night fell and he gave up hope. He lay down without closing his eyes and the strange woman appeared. She pointed at him. You, she said. She was glowing with rage. She had not aged a day. He found himself lifted from the earth. Powerless and afraid, he floated over to the side of the forest where his sons had dwelled all these years and found himself standing. 
He listened to her tell him that she loved him beyond measure when they lived together, even though whatever she loved was not him. He listened to her blame him for turning their sons against her. She blamed him for their disappearance. They were gone. Gone where? The land east of the sun and west of the moon, she said. Had he had his wits about him, he might have asked, shouldn't they have come to him if he had turned them against her? He might have asked her so many things, but all he could manage to ask was, how do I get there? She told him that he could not get there without her, and that it was too stormy of a night. It had been clear earlier, but he saw that she was right. A storm was raging with no sign of breaking. To save them, she said, you must come with me. You must get a good night's rest in a good bed, and I will feed you. She took his hand. It was the first time anyone had touched him in many years, and his hand grasped around hers with no thought. She pulled him in close, and he did not resist. So long had it been since he had been touched. She put his head upon her breast and floated them back home. Every time he asked her when they could go get their sons, she told him they would leave when he had his strength and when the storm broke. And when she asked him to tell her a story, he would repeat one of the tales he had memorized during his days with his sons, either theirs or his, and they were there with him. Although it was not long before she had heard them all, and although they included musicians, fools, acrobats, and dancers, she would listen to them over and over, and he would tell them over and over, until they spent the rest of their days waiting for the storyteller's strength to return and waiting for the storm to break, as they did all manner of things hand in hand. Thank you for listening to the Domestic Aggressive Podcast. This has been The Storyteller's Tale, the first installment of the East of the Sun, West of the Moon Quartet. My name is Meredith Lindgren, and I wrote and read the episode. All sound design and music is by Nathan Paul. <laughs>